All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, so our next speakers are from NIST, uh, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, uh, these are the folks who, who um, help set national standards for a whole host of things, um, in this case, elections. Um, and so we've got both Mary Brady, uh, who's the voting program manager uh, and works on voting specific standards and things like that, and uh, Josh Franklin, who is a security engineer uh, at NIST and works on security related things, including voting. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to you guys. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I'm, I'm also, I, I like to roam, so I, I can't actually speak in front of a podium. But uh, I, I just want to say thanks to the organizing committee uh, to, um, for inviting us to, to give this presentation. I'm really not going to say much other than I, I'm, uh, I'm really excited to be here. I'm looking for meaningful ways to engage with the cybersecurity experts here. Josh will talk a little bit about some public working groups that, that we've established at NIST, one of them on cybersecurity. Some of you I know are already members of that group. We sure could use a, a lot more help. Um, uh, I'd be interested in, in uh, some of your thoughts about meaningful ways in which uh, we can engage with the community. And we're, we're here to tell you a little bit about the work that we're, done, uh, we're doing, uh, get some feedback from you, and uh, look for ways to, to learn from the community. And with that, uh, let me hand it all over to Josh. Are you roaming? Or? I guess I'll roam. Yeah, born to roam. Uh, howdy, everyone. My name's Joshua Franklin. Uh, you know, welcome to Hacker Summer Camp. Um, it's been fun so far. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about my, you know, experiences in the election community for the you know past 10, 12 years. Uh, a a, uh, a uh, little bit about how we, you know, how we got here, where we are. Uh, going. Um, first off, I'm going to start with this slide. Uh, there was a man named uh, Dr. Joseph Harris back in 1934, and he was basically looking at how elections are run in the U.S. back then, uh, and he, and he actually found these you know various election fraud types, as he called them. And it's really interesting looking at this list because we're still really, really worried about many of these issues today. Um, we have since 1934 uh, learned a little bit about, you know, how come come uh, computers work, and we've introduced, you know, e-voting. Uh, and what we've, you know, what we've really seen is that now we have uh, these same issues, but also, you know, modern electronic analogs to some of these same things. And so, you know, keep these in in the back of your mind as we go through some of this. So who am I? Uh, Josh Franklin, IT security engineer at NIST. Uh, I typically do uh, enterprise mo mobility LTE security. I also do electronic voting. Uh, I've been in this area uh, since probably 2004, working in voting off and on. Um, I, I uh, uh, currently co-chair uh, the NIST EAC uh, election cyber security working uh, group. Uh, prior to NIST, I was working uh, at the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, helping to test and certify voting systems. I got to, you know, travel the U.S. and really understand what the, you know, elections landscape looks like there. Uh, uh, previous to that, I was working at KSU's Center for e Election Systems um, in Georgia. Uh, learned a lot of things there. Helped uh, install and main and maintain probably 22,000 voting uh, systems there. Um, I have been a poll worker in more states than anyone I think has, uh, and I will keep saying that until someone proves me otherwise. Um, so yeah, and I have a, a, a master's in InfoSec from Mason. Um, so, uh, you know, get to know, uh, uh, get to know an, an agency. Um, what, you know, what big f uh, federal agencies are out there? Uh, believe it or not, the Federal Election Commission has little to no role to, to uh, play here. Uh, they are pri Merrily focused on uh, uh, campaign finance law. Um, the Election Assistance Commission is what you really want to be looking at here. They are 
charged with uh, providing assistance to local election officials, uh, adopting the voluntary voting system guidelines, uh, and running a testing and certification program for for US voting machines. Uh, NIST is in this space. We provide the scientific and, and engineering backing for the voluntary voting system guidelines. DHS is a brand new entrant into this area. They are you know, basically helping local, local and state election officials with you know, cyber related issues. And then of course the good old F, you know, FBI, uh, they, they essentially prosecute domestic election crimes. Uh, at, the, at the state level, uh, you have the Secretary of State's office, they are pri primarily the, uh, the lead election officer, first and foremost, uh, deciding how elections are run in their given state or, ter or territory. They're typically third in line in su su session in a state, so it's a, it's a fairly powerful elected position. And then at the, at the, at the local level, this is where basically uh, elections are actually run. You have counties, cities, townships, parishes, hamlets, all these different really small geo, geographical uh, entities uh, that you know, really you know, actually know how elections operate b because they actually do them. Um, so it's a little bit uh, blurry. That wasn't just my uh, pencil. Uh, on the right side, we actually have um, you know, the, the voting machines that we all know and, and uh, love. Uh, DREs, op scans, ballot marking devices. These are the voting systems that are actually in the voting hacking village. I was planning on pointing at them right now, but they're not here. Um, so we have, uh, uh, in the uh, top right, we have DREs. These are, you know, basically voting systems that store ballot selections electronically. We have optical scan systems, which, uh, you know, read uh, paper, uh, you know, paper ballot selections, typically Scantron machines, but, you know, modern ones are actually using computer vision algorithms to, you know, figure out what's a, you know, what's a vote. And then we have ballot marking devices. These are a nice hybrid between the, the, uh, the uh, two systems. They actually have a touch screen interface, extremely, uh, the, extremely usable, but they also have nice uh, security properties of, you know, actually printing out a paper ballot. On the, on the, left side are basically all these other supporting election systems. These are things that there are not really best practices and, and guidelines and standards about, but they're actually, you know, they're very, very instrumental in the election process. You have, you know, local and online voter registration systems, uh, electronic poll books. These are the the uh, things that you'll you know check in with at your at your uh, polling place. You have candidate filing systems. If you're going to you know run for uh, governor, you have to file your information with your uh, state at these candidate filing systems. Uh, there's you know also ballot tracking. There's poll worker tracking. There's just a whole slew of other supporting election systems. Um, here you also have you know campaign voter information databases. These are, you know, fairly uh, uh, large scale, uh, you know, information and data collection, uh, you know, efforts, and they're actually holding a lot of really interesting information about all of us. And so uh, when we're, you know, thinking about securing the, the, the election eco, you know, ecosystem, we actually need to have a larger palette there. Uh, this is just for people reading these slides later. Cool. So MapBlaze is right. We, uh, you know, our, our whole threat model has changed since the, you know, 2016 general. Um, uh, previously, we had a threat, a threat model that, w you know, well, at least election officials did. There was a threat, a, a threat model about you know physically proximate uh, attackers. In terms of intelligent adversaries, they're extremely worried about poll uh, poll workers. Poll workers are the uh, are, are you know one of the the nation's largest uh, temporary workforces, um, and you know poll poll uh, workers aren't necessarily vetted. They um, 
uh, you know, to the to, to the degree that that you would want. Um, they often have privileged system access passwords, and they have time to actually play around with these uh, systems. Um, election officials are also extremely worried about accidental errors and, you know events such as that. These are the uh, things that more often than not will actually lead to, to an election, uh, sorry, to, uh, to an incorrect election outcome. Uh, so uh, elections officials are extremely worried about accidental errors. Um, natural disasters such as the 2012 Hurricane Sandy, I think it was 2012, that happened uh, on the you know, East Coast uh, definitely affected elections there and just you know any real event that would uh, that would impact public confidence and trust in the election system but uh, since 2016 uh, we you know we got the intelligence community re uh, uh, re uh, report about you know meddling in our uh, in our elections uh, and what we're you know what we actually have evidence of now is basically nation state uh, uh, attackers um, you know hitting our election systems. We haven't yet seen uh, attacks against vote capture and, tab tab and tabulation systems, uh, at least you know, documented by the IC. But uh, yeah, um, we also saw issues of phishing of both election officials and voting system vendors. Um, and the new threat model is really everything in the old threat model plus cyber, right? Um, yeah, so what do these voting systems actually look like? Uh, they are, you know, embedded legacy systems. That's how I would, you know, talk to someone about them today. Uh, they are typically running some Unix or Linux variant. They might have a, a uh, custom uh, uh, kernel for some reason. Um, some of them are, you know, running Windows CE 3.0. Uh, that's what was run in Georgia when I was there. Um, some of them have really old, um, you know, you know, and pro uh, pro proprietary physical media. I am 30. I should not like. I should not know what a PCM CIA card is, but I do. Uh, you know that. You know that could be a a a, a, a problem there. Um, you know, uh, so net net uh, networking uh, wireless is a fairly common phenomenon. Uh, infrared, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, cellular. Uh, those are definitely things deployed in U.S. voting systems. Um, and these. Uh, and these things are basically needed to last for a long time. Uh, many states are still using systems purchased in 2002, and there's not really a clear upgrade path there. Um, and these uh, and these systems really receive one to five updates over that whole lifetime. Uh, and these you know these updates are extremely ex expensive when they have to update. Um, uh, I like for my first real, you know, job when I wasn't a student assistant anymore at KSU. Uh, I was, you know, basically made to go and physically insert a a PCM CIA card into 6,000 touchscreen units across the state of Georgia to update an expired X.509 cert. Um, yeah, and uh, it was it was really interesting. I got some I got some stories from that. I'll just I'll just uh, I'll just uh, say that. Um, so, uh, you know, now that we've talked about uh, what these, you know, what, what these systems actually look like, uh, what sort of issues have we uh, seen previously? Um, you can uh, you can look at some of the sources for our re results at the very back of this. I will uh, I will tweet out these slides after this uh, after this presentation. But um, uh, you know, Barbara and uh, David were you know talking about these independent re reviews that we saw. Um, of these, uh, you know, of U.S. voting systems, and it's really 15 to 20 independent reviews since probably 2004. Um, so it's actually not a, a lot of outside scrutiny. Um, and what uh, what NIST did recently is that we went through all these different papers, did a you know a literature review, and looked at some of the the uh, the uh, the uh, various issues there, and we then mapped them to common weakness enumeration types, which is basically Basically, a standard for software uh, bug types. Go figure. NIST-like standards, right? Um, and so these were the uh, these were the top five 
uh, software bug types that we saw. Um, these were fairly common issues. I would say very, very common issues uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the papers that we re re uh, viewed. Um, and then just to you know up level them a little bit, we basically saw a lot of input val validation issues. Uh, you know, crypto and authent auth authentication. Um, so it's you know everything's not on fire, right? Um, there are you know good things happening uh, in the the uh, voting arena. Um, risk limiting audits. Uh, these have been really. Uh, I would you know. Uh, go as far to say that this is the you know single best innovation we've had in election security since the year 2000. Uh, uh, These are really meaningful statistical audits that are fairly e e efficient. They can be very very practical, and they don't have to be extremely expensive. Uh, and so they can give uh, an election official a pretty good confidence in the election outcome without spending tons of money and time. Um, Software independence. Uh, this is a concept championed in 2007-08. Uh, basically, meaning that uh, a a bug in the uh, software can't affect the election outcome. There's a there's a better way to uh, say it, um, but uh, it, and practically, right now, this means paper. Um, you know, paper uh, paper voting systems, but this is the up level concept. That's you know more uh, more what desirable characteristics do we actually need in voting in voting systems? Um, there are pro uh, proposals for come come uh, completely software independent, um, uh, fully electronic voting systems. Uh, these are called ETE verifiable cri cryptographic pro pro uh, protocols. These are really cool systems that um, have not. Really Really been used on large scales yet, uh, but they uh, they essentially give a voter a receipt that guarantees them that their uh, that their vote was included in the final t in the final tally, but they can't sell their vote with that receipt. Um, so it's really cool, uh, essentially domain-specific crypto. Um, these things have been uh, they've been used in. T uh, Coma Park, Maryland, and a couple of other places. Um, there's definitely arguing about what you know what constitutes this type of uh, system, uh, but it's definitely a, a you know really interesting research area and a potential path forward. And then finally, recognition of usability as a security issue is a big big problem. Uh, well, it, it, it's sort of a new thing in that uh, you know the community finally said, well, you know what, if it's not you know if it's not Usable uh, availability drops to uh, uh, zero, and that can definitely affect the outcome. Well, at least the uh, the uh, security of the voting system. Um, and so NIST really likes software independence. We are including it in our you know recommendations for uh, you know principles and guidelines for voting systems. Um, but you know paper itself is not a panacea in elections. Um, there are a, a number of uh, physical security oriented issues that can really affect the election outcome. Um, you know, paper primarily gives you tamper detection and and auditability, which is Awesome! That's super, super great. Uh, but you know, paper can be modified. Uh, it's, a, it's you know, it was a very common thing for a long time for whoever is counting ballots to you know put a little piece of you know lead underneath their their uh, fingernail. And if there's not a, a filled in you know bubble, fill in that uh, you know fill in that bubble real, real fast. Um, there are just you know non you know non cyber. Uh, Security related issues. Um, seals and chain of custody need to be uh, verified. If you're not going to actually look at the paper trail, why have it? Um, this this routine, you know, uh, meaningful audits need to be per performed. Y you can't just have paper. You have to actually do something with it. And then, you know, it just generally, we need to you know up the the uh, the uh, level of of cyber hygiene in this area. Looks like I'm doing pretty good on time. Okay. Um, Testing and certif certification. What does this process look like? Um, basically, the Election Assistance Commission runs a uh, a uh, testing and certification program for voting systems. There are uh, there are multiple layers of testing and certification. Uh, the the EAC performs a uh, a federal certif certification, and then states do their own testing for you know their own needs. Uh, some states have rules that are that are 
you know, that are like you should be able to click straight ticket, the whole system then selects all D or all R, uh, but then you should, you know, be able to choose one other person in, in, in the other uh, area. It's like the, uh, the uh, Pennsylvania cross vote is what people call it. And there's just, you know, tons of state specific voting logic issues that states are, are uh, testing for. Um, what does this actually look like? Um, this is, you know, at, 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 at a high level, uh, you know, vendors submit an application to be tested. Uh, the EAC, a, a third party lab, and then the manufacturer sit down, they figure out uh, essentially a testing contract. That's uh, a test plan. Testing occurs. Uh, if there are issues, which, you know, I've never seen a testing campaign that, you know, doesn't have at least one issue, uh, the, you know, vendor goes back, makes a change, and then it gets tested again uh, ad, you know, ad nauseum. Um, at, at the end of the testing process, there's a test report. Uh, the EAC then says, yes, I would like to um, you know, certify, or no, I don't want to certif cert certify. If they do certify, uh, then, it, you know, then a, a voting system goes into their quality monitoring program where states and labs and manufacturers and everyone gives EAC information about how that per performance, uh, well, uh, how that system is performing in the, uh, the uh, field. Um, yeah, I, I'm gonna go back a slide for a second and say, uh, if you're really interested in you know knowing more technical information about voting systems, EAC.gov is literally the best place. They have a a test plan and test reports section, uh, and they have uh, information on new voting systems that aren't really out there yet. A lot of the systems that you know EAC has has certified. Uh, at least to the to the newer standards, um, aren't necessarily deployed in the uh, field yet, or if they are, they're, you know, it's only in limited limited areas. Um, but this is an excellent excellent resource that they're you know doing a serious boon for this community. Um, in terms of voting standards, uh, the Voluntary Voting System Guidelines. It's an awesome name for a standard, right? VVSG. Um, uh, th these uh, standards are pri are are primarily for vote capture and tab uh, and uh, and uh, tabulation systems. So nothing about voter registration, nothing about electronic poll books, election night reporting. Um, there is no federal law mandating that every system uh, com come uh, apply with these standards. There just there just isn't. Uh, the way elections work in the U.S. is that it's you know typically uh, the you know time and manner of choosing is left open to states, and so that's the uh, same here, in that. Uh, you know, states can use uh, completely federally certified systems, uh, systems that are only you know partially certified. Uh, there are you know there's tons of variations out there. Um, in terms of security, um, well, just in, in general, uh, these are the you know various voting standards as I as I see them. Uh, the 1990 VSS and 2002 voting system standards, these, these things were made uh, not necessarily by the federal government. Um, uh, and uh, it, it wasn't until the, um, the Election Assistance Commission was created in 02, I think, that, um, that you know, we actually got the modern VVSG. The modern VVSG has a whole section on so security. Um, didn't really even have that previously that much. Um, uh, and there's been large changes in security as, uh, as new uh, standards have been made. But uh, most systems in the, in, in the US are still certified to the 2002 VSS or 2005 VVSG. And it's mostly 2002 VSS. Um, but yeah, uh, in, in 2007, NIST made some recommendations for, uh, you know, for uh, next generation voting uh, systems. There was uh, like a really robust security architecture that was rec recommended because of some various issues such as software independence pen and pen uh, 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 penetration testing. Those were not uh, eventually uh, adopted. Um, and so what uh, what folks did is they took parts out of the 2007 and parts out of the 2005, smushed them together, and you got the 2015. Um, and so, yeah, that's the most recently adopted standard. Um, NIST and EAC write, 
right now are actually working on a complete, uh, a, you know, it's basically a completely different way of looking at um, election standards, and we're, you know, basically having, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, it's basically driven by. You know, outside input uh, by you know voters and concerned citizens, uh, and we're you know putting t together these next generation re uh, requirements. Um, this you know this new sh uh, structure is going to have principles, guidelines, requirements, and test assertions. Principles and, and guidelines are ultimately going to be what's what's adopted by the federal government, and then re the, the requirements and test assertions are going to be um, a little more malleable uh, because what we've really uh, what we've really seen is that um, you know there's just been a lot of changes and sometimes folks get really uh, locked into certain requirements and it doesn't really help to be locked into requirements from five or ten years ago. Um, from a security perspective, I'm, you know, I'm co-chairing this, uh, this working group on, uh, you know, in this, in this area. Um, these are the seven high-level principles that we have um, listed. Each of these has a number of, you know, sub-guidelines. They're all available at the, uh, at the NIST and EAC voting twiki. Um, uh, uh, a couple of things I'll sort of uh, point out under audit, you know, under auditability, which is the single most important principle that the whole group felt really, really strongly about. Uh, software independence is included under under uh, uh, under that. Um, under access control, we have things like you know two-factor authentication for privileged election op op operations. Uh, for data protection, we have um, you know using well. Uh, well vetted, publicly available, you know, and standardized crypto, which is really, really nice. Um, for software integrity, which we're changing to system integrity, uh, we have you know things like only digitally signed code can actually run on a uh, on a voting system. If you want to talk about these later, I'll be I'll be I'll be around. Um, so just to you know. Before we get to questions and stuff, um, these are some of the big things that I think really need to be ad addressed. Um, we need routine, meaningful audits. Uh, I think that is a really important uh, concept that needs to be enshrined here. Um, we need regular external scrutiny of voting systems. Uh, it is absolutely key. Uh, you know, the more folks who can uh, take a look at these, I am of the opinion, the better. Um, but when folks do find issues, uh, there needs to be responsible vulnerability dis disclosure. Um, do not release a z freaking zero day a week before the the election. Uh, just don't, don't. You know, um, there are, uh, you know, there are well known. Well, I mean. Essentially, if you have issues, uh, if you find an issue, uh, talk to the EAC, talk to to DHS, and yes, if you want to make my you know Monday morning bad, you can send it to me too. Um, that's perfectly fine. Um, so I think that we need to augment how we you know really manage election security. Um, I think risk assessment, threat modeling, contingency planning need to be common terms for for elections officials, and I think that you know they need to be uh, pretty uh, you know pretty knowledgeable in these you know in these concepts. Um, voting systems need regular software updates, just like just like anything. Um, we need to figure out how to get voting systems regular software updates. Uh, I think it is untenable to have voting uh, voting systems with you know CVSS uh, score 10, right? With uh, you know uh, you know 50 of, of those on a voting system. That is just uh, that's just un un you know unacceptable. We need to to find a way how to fix that. Um, and then election officials need actionable. Guidance. You can't just go yell at them and say, "Do this, do this." Um, it's not really going to help any, you know, any any uh, body. Um, they need to, uh, you know, like they need guidance in the language that they speak, um, and so you have to help speak their their uh, their language. Uh, they are typically not uh, cyber security experts. Uh, uh, election officials are, you know, basically logistics champions. They do a really complex operation, and everything's all happening at one at one time. Um, and then, to finally, you know, st I'll, I'll basically stop here. Um, so, help make a a, a difference. Many of you came uh, means that you seem to at least care a little bit. Um, go 
like register and actually vote. Uh, don't let apathy hurt the overall system. Uh, be a poll worker. Um, this is extremely important. Um, uh, it, it will really change how you look at elections, uh, and this is how you can affect change in your local area. And local elections are the elections that will actually have an impact in your in your in your life in a fairly large way, fairly quickly. Um, work with your election official, not against them. Don't antagonize them. Help out. Be a force for good. Uh, and then just completely in a self-serving manner, join these public working groups. Uh, we're fairly nice people. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, Mary and I are here for questions. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, the uh, question was? Uh, sure. Okay. I got room here. Do Phil Donahue. You mentioned joining public working groups to help local election f officials. If you could tell us how to access those. So are, are you bringing up the reference? Yeah, so the, yeah, the, um, the reference. there's a set of seven um, working groups. There's three election groups there's for pre-election, election, post-election. Post -election, and there's four, uh, we call them constituency groups because they're there to sort of help support uh, the elections. But they're uh, human factors, so usability, accessibility, cybersecurity, interoperability, where a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of the common data format work is being played out, and testing. So you can uh, follow a link that maybe is not coming up, or the, the easy way, <laughs> the easy way would be to go, go to vote.nist.gov, and there's a link off of that page to, to the working groups, uh, to the, the Twiki itself. And on there, there's information about how to set up an account and how to, uh, to actually uh, uh, join the mailing lists. And there's a, a bunch of you know, pretty simple videos that you can follow. And if you have any questions, just ask us. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I'll uh, tweet them out in a moment. Yeah, I was going to say we'll post them on the Twitter. Cool. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so how are you addressing resiliency in terms of just uh, maintainability and, and, and continued function as a security threat uh, in how you're setting up the standards or how you're looking at these things? Because it seems like there's a new bigger threat from DDoS by device failure in elections than there is from actual tampering with machines. Uh, we encountered a lot of that in the last election in Maryland, where uh, many of the optical scanners died during the election, and there were and votes were left piled up and, in some cases, unattended while voting machines were, un were the scanners weren't working. So, how do we address the actual uh, ease of operation and continued use? Uh, as part of the security model and putting these standards together. That's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so uh, we do have a maintainability oriented principle that is you know, going to be in, you know, it, uh, like uh, we only saw seven of the actual principles. There's a whole list of other principles as, as, uh, as well. Um, a lot of you know, the answers there are you know, uh, you know, going to be about build quality. Uh, quality assurance. Um, there are, uh, you know, programs that the EAC has, you know, looking into quality assurance areas. But some of that is going to be on the election official themselves um, to make sure that they're taking, uh, you know, good care of their of of their election system. Um, I definitely think that you know manufacturers play a role there as well uh, in you know not you know not using you know bottom of the uh, barrel components. Um, uh, I, you know, personally think I'm a, you know, I'm a big fan of COTS and voting systems, commercial off the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, shelf. Um, you know, I would be pretty, I would be a pretty big fan of like a non-networked voting system, you know, running on like a, a uh, you know, tablet or Raspberry Pi that just prints a ballot right there. Um, uh, and, you know, it, you know, that way if the actual voting system breaks down, you can just go, you know, buy another one um, at Staples or, or something. Um, yeah, it, that's, a, you know, resiliency and maintain a, you know, maintainability are really important questions. Um, 
I, somehow these systems are still working for the most part uh, since 2002. Always kind of, yeah, it is kind of amazing. <laughs> Hope that helps. Uh, thank you very much. Two very quick questions. Number one, are any of the efforts to update the VVSG going to take into account not just voting systems but also non-voting systems? Uh, no. Okay. Um, is EAC planning to address that issue as well? So the databases and the election management systems and... I can't, I can't talk to the EAC. Is NIST? Okay, and then um, uh, to the extent that a lot of people, a lot of counties just aren't going to be able to replace their machines, is the problem that we cannot technically update these software systems or is the problem that we just don't do it? Okay, yeah, I mean, I mean there's not really anything yeah, in yeah, there's, there, yeah, updating voting system software, I mean, it is, it, so we, it costs sometimes over a million dollars to get a, a voting system cert certified. Yes, and so if even one software update occurs, um, then there needs to be uh, a new certif cert certification process. Now, the you know second layer cert certification process, that second order process, doesn't have to be a full million dollar process. Typically, it can be really, really small. I think that the that the EAC has gotten those done in like two or three months, uh, in my in my ex ex experience. Um, but then a local election officials would have to pay for those uh, software updates. Typically, um, you know, folks want you to you know buy the you know latest version of your of you know of an app. Some sometimes, right? I mean, uh, that's a very common thing. And just elections aren't the most well-funded uh, op operations. Let me just add a little bit to that. Um, I, the EAC, uh, prior to embarking on this effort to update the voluntary voting system standards, uh, led a group of uh, led a group of folks that came up with some principles for moving forward. Not to be confused with the principles and guidelines. And uh, you know, one one of the areas that uh, they really do want to figure out, you know, what to do about is how can we, uh, you know, update the software. So so it's in our minds. Uh, we we don't yet have a solution because. It's, you know, we really sort of have to look at the testing process and, and how it would feed into the testing process and how much it would cost and, you know, what, how can this all work. So if you have ideas, we're, we're certainly, you know. Thank you. Um, the voting is the, is the um, domain of the states by the Constitution. Um, um, so the best that NIST can do is to set standards, correct? is to set a standard and then the federal government can provide to the states money to assist the voting um, system, correct? Um, am I talking into the mic? Okay. Okay. Okay, good. I just wanted to ask though, um, you may not want to be speaking for on behalf of NIST, but could you sort of share with us what your ideal voting system would be given the constitution the way that the state the voting works in this country and also um, part two of that maybe not speaking for NIST again do you think that there has been widespread uh, voter fraud regis re voter registration fraud Okay, uh, so for my ideal voting system, I'm gonna have to say I'll see you after class because uh, that hasn't been approved by NIST management. Um, happy to talk to you out there. <laughs> Okay, so there, it was a multi-part question. Now, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's up to the states to determine whether or not they want to adopt the VVSG, and this is, is normally handled uh, within the legislation within in the state legislature. So some states, you know, require certification to uh, require the use of certified uh, systems. Some require uh, the use of uh, systems that are certified by a lab, but not necessarily by EAC, that are tested by a lab and certified, but not necessarily by the EAC. Some require you to, um, the certification to the VVSG, and they might run their own state-sponsored programs uh, to do that. So you're absolutely right. I mean, we can set the standards, you know, but you know, you, but we can't necessarily impose them, uh, you know, on the states. Um, I, 
not really sure what to say about my ideal vo voting system because nothing's been approved by my management either. <laughs> and I don't, I, I can't really comment on, on voter fraud. I mean, it's not, we're sort of kind of outside our, our area of expertise and what, the things that we look at. But, uh, So uh, let me just say that al although the states are not required to use, uh, there, there was some uh, recent study done by uh, NCSL, the, and I always forget what that stands for, the National Council, uh, Conference, Conference of State Legislatures, that uh, indicates that 47 out of the 50 states do actually um, adhere to one of those areas, either, you know, use, uh, either certified systems, certified by lab, or, you know, to the VVSG. Or, or somewhere, you know, even if they don't use those words, they use other words that, you know, that imply it. Uh, so I, I do think that uh, the majority of the states do actually want help. They're looking for help. They're looking for advice. Uh, certainly there, there were quite a number of them that, uh, that voluntarily signed up for, uh, for some of the cyber hygiene services that were, uh, that were available via DHS. So I, I, I think they're listening. They, they you know, they're... I mean, the election officials don't want to be hacked. <laughs> they they want to, the elections to be secure. They 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 want to be assured that the integrity of, of the election is is you know is is certainly uh, withheld. You know. Can you yell as well? Yeah. 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 What exactly are you trying to square there? I mean, like, uh, I don't think we've. Have we said that? No, no, no. Okay. No, it's fine. No, no, no. Yeah, I mean, so we can be. I mean, so you know, an air gap is definitely a you know powerful mit you know mitigation, right, for preventing remote attacks. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, states are, you know, going to have to make that sort of choice them, themselves. Uh, then, you know, if they actually want to have wireless or, you know, wired, you know, networking at all, that's going to be a choice up to them. Um, hmm. I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm not really sure what you're looking for us to say. I, I mean, I, I guess what you're saying is, on the one hand, there there are public comments saying that we're not connected, and we're standing here in front of you saying, you know. You got all of this, you know. And, uh, uh, yes, I, I mean all all of these. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, Josh is absolutely right. It depends on the state. It depends on you know, it, is the state, you know, looking for a certified system? Or are they not? I, you know, it's you know the, the way in, the manner in which they they can conduct elections are, is really up to the state. We don't have any control over what's said in public. You know, you know, the, the only thing we can do is is do our research and, and make it. Uh, you know, make it available. So uh, we we don't actually do the certification at NIST. The the uh, the voting system test laboratories go through uh, the, uh, the the actual uh, voting systems, and there's a series of tests that they run. The tests are developed by the voting system test laboratories, although we provide uh, guidance into what they should be. And one of the the things that the voting system test laboratories do have is access to source code, and you know they all of the systems that you know that undergo that testing uh, undergo a source code review.
Oh, thank you. That's yeah, uh, yeah. that's interesting. It's, yeah, uh, we'll we'll wait and see what Congress does. <laughs> No, I, I didn't. I, yeah. but Mike can reach her, so. <laughs> okay, so since January, uh, the Department of Homeland Security's decision to um, decide that election uh, voting systems, sorry, are critical infrastructure, right? So January, they decided, okay, voting systems are now critical infrastructure. How is it that they're critical infrastructure, yet the EAC, the federal entity that oversees voting systems, has no teeth, in essence, and that some states still do not have to abide by the voluntary voting system guidelines. When will the voluntary, the first V in that VVSG, be dropped, since we now know that they are critical infrastructure. Wisconsin is one of your three states that in its statutes says it does not have to and will not only use certified machines. So it's a big issue and Wisconsin's a swing state and they're not interested in changing their voting systems. They like having that control. So what's your opinion of when we'll drop that first V? I think, yeah, I think Candace is right. Talk to your congressman or woman. Uh, I, we have no con control over over dropping that that you know that first V. Um, I haven't really heard serious pro proposals about about doing that either. I just haven't heard them you know, discussed at all. I'm an activist, and I've been doing it for many years, and I thank you for your presentation. But I take exception with a few things, okay? I take exception with the EAC when they certify something like virtual private networks, and I go into a court case, and the head guy of Wisconsin says, Hess, uh, gee, uh, how, I said, how could you let these virtual private networks be set up? Because we know most fraud is done by insiders, okay? One person, and he says, hey, I wasn't me, it was certified by the EAC, okay? And when you look at those guidelines, okay, you know, when they pa passed the Help America Vote Act, there was no security standards until 2005. Two billion dollars is spent on these crap machines is what they really were, okay? You know, I get very frustrated when an elections administrator says to me, we know it's working really well. We did a logic and accuracy test before and after. Well, I know when that test was done, it probably worked right. All you gotta remember is Volkswagen, my God, they passed 600,000 tests. The machine was built to rig to, to pass. You buy a flat screen TV, says it's high energy efficient, okay? You plug in the tester, the screen goes dim. It cheated. We need systems that are transparent, trackable, publicly verified. Uh, you know, the stuff that comes out of the EAC just blows my mind of how inept, un you know, they don't, I don't think they even had a chair of that committee for, what, six years or something like that? I mean, what are we to do, the voters, to know that we live in a country that makes believe that we're that other country? We know how fraction magic works. We know how the systems are set up. Uh, and then to be insulted with these virtual private networks being set up and have somebody, like I said, in court stand up and says, well, gee, we didn't certify it. The EAC did. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Um, so I think everything you just, you know, talked about is, you know, sort of really shows the need for, you know, outside external scrutiny, you know, regularly. Um, I think that is a powerful force. Uh, this is an, you know, the, this is a large collection of a, a examples of basically outside of scrutiny. Um, you know, it, it you know definitely provides a uh, a check against the uh, the certification process. Um, yeah. 
Do I just yell? Yeah, a lot of people have said that because our collection voting system is so fractured in a weird way, that's actually a cause of security. Because you, yes, you have standardized vendors who are generally making most of the machines, but an attack vector, somebody searching for attack vector doesn't know what state they're patching their app, what security they're running, how they're actually going out, and where they're at in their update process. If we go through a standardized process, are we creating a perverse chance of decreasing security by standardizing cross vectors? Uh, sorry, uh, standardizing attack vectors massively? Good question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the actual standards that we're going to be you know, making are, are basically, you know, going to be vendor agnostic. And so any number of vendors can, you know, submit their, uh, their uh, systems for cert certification. Uh, and so, you know, we would still have that, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, that, that nice diversity. Diversity of vendors. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I do like the you know you know voting system diversity. I do think it is a a serious boon. But I mean, if you look on the internet, I mean, you're going to be able to find operating system versions and patch in patch levels in a lot of places. And so I just don't want to put too much emphasis on that. I think uh, I think things like software independence and regular meaningful audits are a much more stronger uh, security mechanism to make our you know overall system more secure. To be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. So one more thing uh, after these guys wrap up, I do want to give them a round of applause. But um, so we've already had our first two successful um, breaches in the um, voting village. A win vote was wirelessly hacked with remote access already, and an e-poll book internal data structure was already hacked, and that was about 20 minutes ago. So an hour and 40 minutes in, and we've already got our first two successful hacks. So, all right.